like to introduce Ben Schmidt. Uh, ben is the Director of Information Security at Wallace. Prior role, Ben held the position of Global Director of IT Security Compliance at Donfoss Group? Donfoss Group? Denfoss. Denfoss Group, responsible for network and application security, including ERP systems. Ben is a Wisconsin native, which we don't hold against him. Haley from Manitowoc. You got it. Ooh, Wisconsin. <laughs> yes, he's watched Making a Murder. Nice. And has started his Infinex career with TDS Telecom in Madison, Wisconsin, covering ISP and enterprise security as a security architect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Uh, we're going to talk about defense today. Um, we hear a lot about offense, a ton about how many shells did I pop and what, what, what came out of the infiltrate con. And that's great, but I think defense is maybe missed a little bit. So my goal is to make defense sound really cool. That's ultimately my goal. We'll stick it to pen testers a little bit, and I'll walk through different strategies on how to do that. So who am I? Greg just did a pretty good job introducing. Um, ben and I play defense, and I have the privilege of leading InfoSec at Douala uh, here in Des Moines. Been there about two and a half years, and it's been awesome. Um, so again, I'll, I'll go through what I want to call is like a playbook. This is not all the plays in a defensive arsenal. These are just plays I think show new design patterns, different techniques we can use against adversaries, or for that matter, stop giving low-hanging fruit to pen testers. We can stop some of that stuff. Um, so my buddy Nate Suber is not here, but he usually talks about offense and kind of sticks it to me. So I'm going to stick it to Nate in a very nice way today about here's some cool defensive things because you can do defense and still kind of be a badass. It's still possible to do that. Um, so let's kind of start with a story here. Um, actually, before I start in a story, a couple of things. So we're going to talk about defense. I'm also a member of SecDSM, so the Capture the Flag is led by SecDSM. That's another group here in Des Moines that meets monthly, so if you have any interest in meeting monthly, not just once a year, please stop down, go to secdsm.org. Um, we're also hiring at DeWall. I want to just put a quick shout out there. Come talk to me about that, site reliability engineer, sysadmin, and some other roles. Happy to talk about how that, uh, those roles help play defense and what we do. All right, so I'm going to start with a, a story here. So my dad's a retired firefighter. And you're like, all right, Ben, why is that important? So I learned a bit about the evolution of the fire service from him. So I learned, like, back in the 70s and 80s, they had metrics on, well, how many fires did I put out, right? And the number of fires I put out is a cool metric. And actually, like, I don't know if it's the coolest metric because it's based on the number of fires and how fast you got there and put them out. And that's your effectiveness, but shouldn't you prevent fires? So fire, the fire service has evolved into prevention and survival inspections, building codes that reflect safe ways to make ingress and egress. Um, education, right? I think our kids have all, all know what stop, drop, and roll means. I think they still teach that. Um, careful design. Um, so these are things that are important to prevent fires. And I think that's how we play defense now. It's not necessarily great, like, how many viruses I got. It's kind of a vanity metric. But how many intrusions did I stop and prevent is a good indicator. So we're going to talk about the fire service evolving and how we evolved. And that is actually from Manitowoc. That is um, that's a Pierce um, ladder truck. Um, they actually call it Precious. That's one of its nicknames. So um, it's an important fire truck, but again, prevention is much more important. So InfoSec has this fascination with playing offense. Um, and just like every kid in my high school you know, football team, in freshman year, I played football one year. I was too small. But I did play one year and then you know, didn't play anymore. And the first day of tryouts, what does every kid want to play? Running back, running back, running back. And so guess what position I played? Defensive lineman. Because I'm a slow dude, and that's what fit. But I learned from that. I played defense, and defense really matters. So let's think about InfoSec here. And I totally get you can't play defense without knowing offense. Uh, Chen's on my team. Yes, we can run Nmap and Metasploit, and we can uh, use Netcat. Like, we can do that stuff. We understand the basics, but... Um, we also don't walk around with flamethrowers, making things more secure. We want to play defense. Um, I don't think you can pen test your way to profitability, but you can play really good defense and demonstrate to your customers, hey, this product has assurance versus I have a team of the greatest pen testers on earth. That's important, but playing defense I think is even more important. All right, so really busy slide, but there's a lot to talk about. So resumes come in, and I review those resumes. Um, and some come in with a little working experience, and that's cool. And like all of them mention Kali Linux. All right? Nice. That's in there. Um, I don't see anyone mention threat modeling. 
Um, maybe it's this Mr. Robot thing, but as far as uh, Kali Linux goes, so I eventually get into a phone screen, right? And I'm like, great, you've used Kali Linux, that's wonderful, what'd you use it for? Oh, for analysis and scanning, and I'm like, well, cool. So let's talk about a theoretical here, which may or may not help with Kali, but let's say I give you a two gigabyte text file, just like straight up syslog from a server. How are you gonna go through that and get information? Like, how many IPs attacked a trusted host? Like, how are you gonna get that out of there? You can't throw two gigs in Excel, it's just not gonna happen. Oh, I'd, I'd use Kali Linux. Okay, how would you use Kali Linux? Oh, I'd use Wireshark. I'm like, no, we're not dealing with PCAPs here. Like, we're dealing with straight up syslog. How are you gonna go through that? Oh, I'd use Wireshark. And it just kind of like frustrates me. It's like, don't put Kali Linux on your resume, like from a vanity thing. It's not cool unless you know what it means. Let's talk about how you can play defense. So again, breaking things, pivoting around an organization, pillaging sysadmins, taking their credentials, and exfiltrating data might be exciting but I think protecting the crown duels is pretty damn important. That's what we're gonna focus on today. Um, and I gotta put this InfoSec Maxim out there. Defense has to be right every time and offense has to be right once. Okay, so what does that mean? It means this fire service correlation matters. We have to focus on prevention, not successful exploitation. So uh, Wendy Nather, I've never met her, but she works at Duo Security, had this tweet I really liked. Wish we had more InfoSec firefighters rather than so many standing around with lighters, hoping, uh, helpfully pointing out flammables. So it's all coming together. The football team's there, firefighter themes there. So what change is happening? Well, I think there's a, a renaissance here in playing defense. So there's two conferences that are really good examples. Uh, one is the O'Reilly Security Conference. Um, and that's kind of their tagline. They provide advice, but it's focused almost purely on playing defense. It's their second year. It's in New York, and it's to make sure defense has a conference where you can network and collaborate and not have to talk about Metasploit or these other wonderful tools, I'm not trying to dig on those tools, but talk about creative ways of playing defense. There's another one that just happened uh, a couple months ago in Austin, Texas called Art Into Science. Again, purely defensive conference. And not just like how to do firewall rules and play defense, like really elegant design patterns. And these design patterns, what are some examples? Um, deception technology, which is a fancy term for honey pots and honey tokens and putting breadcrumbs around your network to detect adversaries. Um, your adversary is kind of thinking like an API. They're gonna crawl around under your GUI so you can plant things on your network, like a fake network attached storage device, something you wouldn't normally use unless you're an adversary. Um, there's really neat uh, design patterns Slack is doing where they ship their logs centrally uh, and really good logs from Audit D or their own tool called Go Audit. So kernel level, really robust logs. Ship them centrally, audit those, and then from that, they have bots or a statistical model that will use Slack to say, "Hey, miss, um, why are you running dtrace at three in the morning? You've never done that before. Send a push to your phone. True or false? You know, is that you? Yes or no? You hit yes. Well, good. You update the model. Now you use dtrace at three in the morning. If that wasn't you and you tap no in your phone, that's a security event." and then we can respond to it really quickly. I think that's really elegant design pattern, how to play really good defense. You're not dealing with signatures and thresholds, you're dealing with math. And using your phone as a, multi, as a secondary factor that's trusted to then acknowledge yes or no it was you. If an adversary has your credentials, they probably have access to Slack and they'll just say, of course it was me. I'm really busy, go away. But if they send something to your phone, I don't know, I sleep next to mine, you're probably gonna acknowledge that. And if you don't, over a period of time, you can escalate. So that's one example. Um, immutable architecture, anyone deal with this? This one's pretty neat. Um, kind of you're born in the cloud, but I think the, the concept makes sense. Um, when we deploy uh, my company servers or, or images, we treat them like cattle, not like pets. We knock those things over and we spawn new ones. We do not patch them. Yes, we have a handful of long-lived instances, but when we deploy a service and deploy servers, they're virtualized, right? And they have a root of trust. We sign them, they come from a good place. Well, we don't patch them, there's a vulnerability. We just knock those things over, bring up a new AMI or image from Amazon, and it's fully patched. So that's how vulnerability management's changing. That's pretty neat. Instead of SSHing in or connecting it via RDP or running WSUS or SCCM or whatever you have for your enterprise patching botnet, like these things will automatically patch when they come up. And that's a pretty neat way so, uh, to do security. And so two tweets. 
I put Wendy's in before, so I haven't heard twice. I guess I really liked it. Um, but Haroon Mir is from a company called Thinkst, and they build a canary, which is a hardware device that's a honeypot. You plug it into your network, and you say, I want this to be a skater device. I want it to be a NAS. I want it to be whatever you might want. And you put that thing in a back-end protected or segmented network, and it goes off. You've got a pen tester on your hands. And if you catch them, that goes in your report, and that's really good. If it's not a pen tester, you have a bigger problem, then you've got to squash that issue. You turn that intrusion into a security event, don't let it become a breach. Um, and so that, that, uh, th this tweet at Slack is really interesting with what they do with their Linux auditing. All right, so um, my wife and I were driving back from St. Louis, and she was taking notes. I'm like, all right, I'm going to throw a bunch of different offensive tactics um, out in a table. So she's like taking notes. And then we're going to talk about defense. And there's a lot of them. So we're not going to go through all these. And this is not an exhaustive list, right? This is just a list of ones that I thought were interesting for the talk. So we're going to go ahead and see how can defense keep points off the board. Maybe even turn a fumble into an opportunity. Because uh, defense matters and it wins championships. So we're going to glorify defenders out here and go through a playbook. Um, there's a link at the bottom. MITRE has a wonderful uh, and much more in-depth listing of different tactics. So definitely check that link out. But we're going to go through a subset of these. And I have an appendix. If we have time, we'll go through the appendix. But we'll probably not have the time. But maybe we will. So let's go through some of these and kind of go through a playbook. How do we make pen testers' lives harder or make our adversaries' lives hard? So first one is man in the middle. Um, so we've got Alice, Bob, and Eve. If you've ever done crypto, you're going to hear those names a lot. Two parties have to exchange information across potentially an untrusted network. So you've got to use some crypto. So what is a, a variation of this? And this one's for real, and I recommend you, you, you check out that link. Because we have to learn from problems that happen. So in this case, there's a bank called N26 in Europe, and that bank has an API that is used for their mobile app. Someone man in the middle of the API, and it's a very verbose API, um, which gives away a lot of information. And the information was used creatively to do things that could allow that um, application to be abused. So I won't talk too much about that, but definitely check out that link from uh, the Chaos Computer Congress. But man in the middling is no, no joke. This stuff really happens. So what can defense do about man in the middling? And yeah, we can do VPNs and all kinds of stuff, but let's just talk about the edge of your network. Because everyone here probably has a website, maybe a web app, maybe internal web apps. So the first thing is TLS 1.3 is on its way. It's basically here. I will talk about that in a second. But you should make sure that edge is appropriately configured. If you're doing older versions of TLS, and if you're doing SSL, that's naughty. You shouldn't be doing SSL, right? Okay. I'm not going to talk about it ever again. Um, but 1.3 is on its way, and it makes some really cool decisions for you. So I won't go down a TLS rabbit hole, but 1.3 does some cool stuff. Really fast session setup. The handshake's been reduced. It's not two round trips. It's one or zero, because if you have existing key material, it can be reused to reestablish a connection to a trusted site. Um, and they're using really good cipher suites. You're not going to use some of the garbage like RC4. Can't do it. You're just not going to be able to do that stuff. They pick it for you. Uh, we'll talk about authenticated encryption associated data ciphers a bit later, but there's only two right now in TLS 1.3 you can use. You can use AES GCM and elliptical curve keys, um, or you can use Cha Cha 20 Poly 1305, which is from the NACL suite. That's it. And both of those are authenticated encryption with associated data. Ultimately, it means it's confidentiality and integrity. So I won't, I won't go too deep here, but if you're using AES, you've heard of CBC mode. Um, cipher block chaining. It's fine. It's not, not that weak, but it does not provide integrity, purely confidentiality. So if you do a forgery or something, it may not get detected if you're messing with the blocks. Whereas GCM mode, it stands for Galloway counter mode, it has a MAC in between each block based on a counter that allows you to provide confidentiality and integrity. And that's pretty important when you're doing TLS. Um, one of the CTF um, exercises for heart bleed, and this is a mitigation for that threat. Um, so TLS 1.3 is there. And when I say it's there, uh, it's pretty hard to see, but that's a screenshot from Wireshark. Not for log analysis like those who are applying for jobs. It's actual TLS 1.3 traffic. Chen and I were um, making sure we could show you, like, this is real stuff. So TLS 1.3 uh, works. That is what Chen and I were doing from my laptop out to Cloudflare's Edge. Cloudflare is an early adopter of 1.3. They're on the IETF, and they helped a lot with it being defined as a standard. So 1.3 is there. Um, there's also certificate pinning and HSTS, helps for man in the middling. 
So if you're going to run Burp Suite or something, HSTL, so make it a little harder for people to screw around and proxy. Um, another thing is signing is totally something that we should do more of. Um, SMB signing is something, if you use Windows, you probably have turned on, but signing is providing assurance data has been manipulated. And so I take signing really seriously. Chen and I do a lot of signing, right, Chen? Yeah. Um, so it's really important to make sure stuff is not tampered with. All right, password cracking. So the goal is not to store these things, right? You should have a trusted identity provider and use that. If you've got to store passwords, you have to use a key derivation-based protection solution. Key derivation functions are slow and painful for all the right reasons versus I'm going to do naked SHA-1 or SHA-256. That's really fast. The SHA family is meant to be fast. Key, der key derivation functions are meant to be slow. Slow so that if you lose your password database and an adversary gets it, I want them to have a very bad time. This is defense sticking it to them. So we're not worried about rainbow tables and all these things if you're doing some of these uh, the right way. So I'll, I'll give some examples here. Um, these are all not meant to be fast or performant for the right reason. So one's called Argon2. There's two variants of Argon2, but this is a really new password-based hashing solution, and it's both memory and CPU hard. So you can't just throw GPUs and ASICs at it. You have to throw ridiculous amounts of memory at it, too. So it's a really difficult way of trying to um, brute force the resultant um, output of, of Argon2 or Argon 2i. It also has protections for side channel attacks based on timing. It's really nice. Um, S-Crypt's another one. These are recommended work factors based on parallelization, number of rounds, et cetera. Um, S-Crypt's not super popular, but it's been out for a while, and it's pretty, pretty strong. Uh, Bcrypt is probably the most popular one. A lot of the frameworks have this built in. It's based on Blowfish underneath, and it is pretty expensive. And then there's PBKDF2, password-based key derivation function 2 that's a NIST standard. It's recommended if you do it 86,000 or more iterations. And why do we do this? To make a pen tester's job or an adversary's job harder. So if you're going to store passwords, you've got to do this stuff. Using naked SHA is a bad idea. It's just a matter of them figuring it out. If you have a global salt, they're probably sitting somewhere in a data store. They're going to get that too. All right, message forgery. So we're going to touch on signing now. We talked about crypto a little bit at TLS. Talk about message forgery. So your messages are pretty important, even some log stuff, because they may have to go into an investigation or in the legal system, and you have to prove they have integrity. You have to deal with repudiation issues. So what do we do here? We can sign log files, sign messages to prove they have integrity. Because you want to make sure if you have a message from a trusted entity, it's not been manipulated. Okay? So up on the right, uh, that's really hard to see. I apologize. But um, that's something Chen and I were doing. Um, there is a suite of cryptographic solutions. It's called NACL. It's not NIST crypto, but it is very strong. It's out of academia, and it's uh, gaining quite a bit in Europe. Um, but NACL has pretty safe variations of crypto you can use that are strong and performant, and they kind of make it difficult for you to screw it up based on their API or interface. So this is a little something we did in Python, but we signed B-Sides Iowa, printed the signing and verification keys out and proved that it worked. So that was a nice example of using signing. Um, and this signing is done not with a symmetric key, it's asymmetric key. So you sign with one key and you verify with the other. So it's really nice and strong for distributed scenarios. So what can we do here? So I talked about authenticated encryption and associated data or cryptographic signing. And there's also something called a keyed MAC. Um, so you've heard of HMAC before. So let's say you have webhooks and you want to emit messages to your clients. You're probably going to sign those using like an HMAC and then a key. So these are methods of signing things so the message can't be forged. Um, a couple things about crypto. And again, I've got one more slide and then I'll stop on the crypto. We can talk more later. Um, RSA is getting a little long in the tooth. I'm not a cryptographer, but it's not my favorite. Elliptical curve seems to be taking its place, at least for the near term. We won't go into quantum computing. We can talk about that, too. Let's just say ECC is safe for now. Uh, but don't be afraid of non-NIST standards. I stick with a lot of NIST, but there's a little, there are other times non-NIST standards, like ED25519, make sense. That's part of NACL. Um, we like that one. And then an HMAC is a keyed MAC. It's a pretty uh, leading solution. You're going to see that a lot. And I'm warming up to CMAC. Chen and I have been testing that one quite a bit. Very fast. But whenever something's really fast, it could be dangerous. So we're checking into that. But message forgery is a big deal. It's also not just messages, right? You may get software. If you pull software down from a repository, you probably want to check that it's signed. 
not just pull it down and trust that it's cool. So sign all the things. This is like, to me, I think it's a trend. We're going to see more and more signing to establish root of trust and make sure things are, are authentic, not been forged. All right, little sidebar on crypto, and then I will stop, I promise. Um, that's Pluto. and I don't know if it's still a planet now or a dwarf planet, whatever they call it, but think of the following uh, problem. What if I said, draw a line from the sun to Pluto, and that is the radius of a sphere, and then tell me how many grains of rice you could fit inside of that sphere? Can you solve that problem with reasonable precision? The answer is no, that's an intractable problem. That's like super hard. I wouldn't even begin to know how to do that. So this is one of those times crypto should be that hard for an adversary to break if it's implemented correctly. Um, it might be one of the few times it gives defenders the upper hand because if crypto is done properly, we trust it. It makes the problem of breaking it intractable. All right, so a couple tidbits on crypto and then we'll stop, but I can go down a rabbit hole more if you want to later. So TLS 1.2 and 1.3, just do it. Um, if you're PCI compliant, you're 1.2 and above anyways. And we've been analyzing the edge, and it's something that we think is very doable. Um, and 1.3 is cool. Like, please check it out. Uh, Cloudflare's blogged a lot about it. I mentioned GCM already, authenticated encryption. The other cool thing about GCM is that since it's a counter mode, it can be parallelized. So it can be really fast, crypto. CBC cannot be parallelized. So that's kind of neat. Um, initialization vectors matter. That's randomness. That's an input into uh, a computation. So if you encrypt my last name, which is Schmidt, you should get a result in ciphertext. If you encrypt it again, you should get a different ciphertext. They shouldn't repeat. Initialization vectors handle that. You need good randomness to create those things, so please use dev u random for getting your randomness. Uh, don't be afraid of elliptical curves. If you're using hashes, you guys all heard SHA-1 is effectively broken, right? Google demonstrated that. Two PDF, same SHA-1 signature. We're not even going to say MD5, like we're not even going to say SSH, or SSL, I mean. But the SHA-2 or SHA-3 family, please check them out. Use those things. Uh, don't put your keys in your code. Can you rotate your keys? Do you have forward secrecy based on key exchange? These are things you should ask your vendor if they say they have wonderful implementations of crypto. Like, ask this stuff. How do you rotate your keys? You better have an answer for that one. Um, and, and I said before, uh, NIST standards are great. The NACL standards are great for the win, so check those two out. And I put a link to one of my favorite um, people that talks about crypto. His name's Tom Toshik. And that's a link to his gist. And he calls it cryptographic right answers. It gives really good guidance. called the Cliff's Notes of crypto. So I'll get off my little crypto soapbox. But it puts defenders in, I think, the driver's seat. All right, credential stealing. OK, so I've got my friend Nate pen testing, right? And so Nate somehow gets credentials. Let's see, he guessed them or sniffed them, whatever. Nate's got credentials. All right, great. And he wants to do some evil. So I want to stick it to Nate with some multi-factor auth, right? We all like multi-factor auth. Um, so you can use UB keys. I've got one on my laptop now. You can use Duo security. So when my buddy Nate decides to RDP into a box, I want him to see that and I want him to be like, damn. Um, I'm sure he can get past it creatively and I hope to monitor and catch him, but I want him to see that before he logs into a Windows box. I want Nate to know this pops up on my phone and I can see that there was a login request. I obscured well, which host it's to, but that actually comes to my phone and I tap yes or no. If it's no, it's a security event. If it's yes, it's me because this is my phone and it's in my pocket at all times. Uh, it could be I want to use YubiKey to multi-factor into LastPass. So you got to have access to my laptop, have my YubiKey, know my long master passphrase. That's probably not going to happen. So multi-factor is really important. Start with your highest risk users, sysadmins, executives, roll that stuff out. Uh, I don't work for Duo, but I love their stuff. Really neat stuff. Um, and, and what's really neat about Duo for two reasons, are push notifications. One is it's a trusted channel. So that push notifications out of band. Remember I said that adversary, if they have your credentials, they're gonna hop in Slack or HipChat or Link or whatever you use and say, yeah, that's me. But they're probably not gonna take your phone. Man in the middle is Apple push notification be able to use the private key on the phone and Duo's back end to obscure it. Like, this is just not going to happen unless you're dealing with a nation state actor here. So um, really nice trusted channel. Now, the other thing is multi-factor devalues a password. So passwords used to be the gold standard. You get that, you can get in. If I use multi-factor and a password, the value of that password goes way down, which is really nice. Devaluing data is a key defensive tactic. Uh, persistence. So an adversary wants to gain a foothold in an environment, 
they probably want to come back. They probably don't want to do all that work again. They want to be quiet and silent. They want to have some persistence and get back uh, to where they were if there's an interruption. So one defensive play is we'll throw some flux at them. So flux and immutable architecture is something I, you could throw at them. So um, there's a metric, and Netflix has a pretty neat one. They follow this immutable architecture design. They can run a command to see how long their instances or servers have been up. And we're talking days, like across their platform, maybe weeks. I forgot the last metric. I should have looked it up. But their servers don't live that long. They simply roll new ones all the time. If you have a stateless microservice that's load balanced, went well, awesome. Knock the server over, bring one up. Knock the server over, bring one up. And you, as the consumer, don't know that. The back end just happens. So persistence in an environment that has immutable architecture and that rolls the servers on, you know, from a trusted root of, uh, from a root of trust and rolls them often, that's pretty neat. Pretty hard to have persistence there. Um, that's kind of a laboratory thing, but I think that's a neat tactic. Um, you have to have all the basics, too. I'm not saying immutable architecture is the solution, but it's a nice additive layer, right? Continuous security monitoring, et cetera. Um, and then there's a bonus here. Immutable architecture shouldn't change, right? It's going to connect back to a data store, but you're not going to install GCC in an immutable architecture environment. You're not going to do that. So if anything in your immutable architecture changes, that's rogue. Either sysadmin's screwing around or you have an incident in your hands. It could, you, you can loosely say it turns your whole architecture into a honeypot. So I think that's a pretty neat defensive play. Ah, design flaws. So I mentioned threat modeling before. I love this stuff. We can talk later about threat modeling if you want. Um, but how do you build security into a solution? Well, you should do it at design time. I'm sure you've all heard it's really difficult to bolt security on. You should always bake it in. So a robust threat model can improve security design, drive testing, and reduce cost. That's a nice political statement. What does it mean? It means you don't make bad design decisions if you can prevent them early. Like, that's a really bad design decision. I don't know how that happened. Um, I don't even know how, if, if the guys in the CTF room could pick that lock. I mean, that's pretty nuts. Um, maybe it's a joke. I don't know. I found it on the Internet. But we want to prevent design decisions or choices as early as possible, as far left in the development cycle, left meaning when I'm actually designing or authoring uh, code versus it's out in production. So threat modeling is a way to do this. Um, the one that we use, the one we like, is called STRIDE. It's from Microsoft. Stands for spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. I've done this one a lot. We can do it again later if you want to talk about that. But those are different types of threats you can apply to a decomposed application. So you're like, tell me more. All right, you have a solution, a web app. I don't know what it is. Um, Let's say it's a solution that stores legal documents. Cool. So what's the application decompose? Where does the data live? It has a data store somewhere. All right. Well, what other assets are important? Is it just the data store? Or are there other assets that are key uh, to this scenario? Images, I don't know. Um, what are the external entities? Who's using it? Is it purely internal? Are the people VPNing in? Is it exposed via Citrix? Is it proxied? Who are the external entities? What are the trust boundaries? Basically, is it in a server cage? Is it in a trusted data center? Is it spread across multiple data centers? Is it inside of a DMZ? Like, where are the boundaries physically and logically for this thing? Um, what are the entry and exit points? Basically, like, are you using zero trust networking and you're tagging applying policy based on trust? You have your narrow firewall rules defined. Are you making sure that IPv6 is blocked as well as v4? Uh, stuff like this. Um, and then what are the key technologies? If it's written in really old PHP, like that's probably not OK. PHP can be perfectly secured. Look at Etsy. They do it. So it's Facebook for that matter. Um, but your technology choices matter. Um, and then who are the threat agents? What are you dealing with here? So that's like a mental model of decomposing an application. You can make that model on paper. Where's the data stores? Where are the trust boundaries? Where are the external entities? And then wherever data crosses a trust boundary, like that's where you should look at the threats. So then how can I do spoofing? How can I do tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and privilege escalation, or escalation of privilege? So that's a really good way to look at your application, apply stride against it, and it should be done in teams. And then from that, you can see how you mitigate, or have to then mitigate in your design those different threats. Uh, so what's an example? If I know that messages can be tampered somewhere, I want to sign those. You heard me say cryptographic signing earlier. That's a good example of a mitigation of threat model. So there's a pretty example of a threat model um, in a graphic.
But if you want to know more about this, pull me aside. I'll walk through some with you and show you them a little bit more graphically if you'd like. Buffer overflows. So adversaries may leverage non-memory safe languages to overflow a buffer. So we're talking like C, C++ kind of stuff here. Um, and it can also happen without an adversary forcing the issue, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so, you know, there's another old computer saying, and I talked about it earlier, if it's got to be fast, it's probably dangerous. And C and C++ is a good example of that. If you're not using memory safe allocations, like, you can overflow a buffer really easily. Um, and this just happened. Um, happened at Cloudflare a couple months ago, where they had a legacy component that was written in C. There was a buffer issue, and they were exposing in some of the responses to clients other areas of memory that may have contained tokens and other stuff. It's bad. They did a wonderful job cleaning up and responding to it, and I'm sure their code audits and response make them extremely secure right now. Um, but this is a big deal. Like This stuff still happens. And buffer overflows, I've been hearing about them since I was in my teens, I think. Um, so what do you do? What's the defensive play here? What's out of the playbook here? Use memory safe languages or really good protections. I first just had memory safe languages and Chen said, no, Ben, people still need to use this stuff, so they should be using protections if they're writing stuff in non-memory safe languages, closer to the middle. So address space layout randomization, DEP for memory execution, uh, protection, et cetera. Well, you can use memory safe languages and they're really good. They're getting really fast. So any of your .NET stuff, they check the memory. Uh, Java's been doing it for a long time, Python, Go. Go might be one of the fastest. I touched on Cloudflare a lot, if not almost all of their stuff is written in Go, which is a language from Google, and it is super fast and performant and is memory safe. Um, all right, cool. Reconnaissance. So adversaries need to learn by research identification or selection of your targets. Like they have to enumerate your attack surface and do investigation. Well, you should have really robust monitoring and pay, maybe even some deception techniques. So a good example is on the edge of my platform, if you're using some crappy bot and it doesn't do full on JavaScript like you would have in a normal Chrome browser, we're probably gonna look at the user agent, probably look at your IP address, and we're probably gonna challenge it. Use some interstitial pages and challenges doing JavaScript puzzles. And if you don't solve those quickly, you're probably a bot and then we're gonna go ahead and deal with it. So like we can have really good monitoring and then take actions on those monitoring things quickly at the edge. Um, I'm a big believer in network security monitoring. Any of you guys know who Richard Baitlick is? He used to lead a bunch of security actually at Mandiant or FireEye, um, but he has wonderful, reading, uh, wonderful stories about out of band monitoring and network security monitoring. But I think if someone's doing recon, we can probably get some information back. So there's honey pots, honey tokens. I mentioned things to Canary. Um, th there's another um, set of campaigns or tools in Symmetria that's really interesting, but you can put certain elements in your environment that no one should ever connect to. You can put them inside of Word docs even. And if someone's opening these Word docs or looking at these tokens, someone's doing reconnaissance. You should probably figure out what's going on, have adaptive defense, and then deal with it. Um, so I mentioned a fake NAS on a protected segment. You shouldn't touch that thing. It's a very high value alert. I think we all get low value alerts in our inbox that's just noisy. That's one of those alerts that should never go off. And you should have those alerts in your environment. And if it goes off, you got a problem. Um, and I put a link. Um, this is from the NSA. And they were pretty transparent saying, here's how you keep us out of your environment. And one of the ways is not letting them learn about your network. The gentleman from the NSA um, basically said, I'm going to know your network better than you by the time we want to do something. We'll stop the reconnaissance. That's a good defensive play here. <coughs> Um, anyone know what airplane that is, by the way? Extra credit? U2, exactly. sr 71s too easy, so we have to put the U2 in there. All right, this is pivoting and lateral movement. Let our adversaries' powers combine. So we've done some reconnaissance, we've stole some credentials, we've elevated privilege, and we're going to try and walk around your network. Pivot from segment to segment, zone to zone. So we're going to let the defensive powers combine. Strong authentication, containment, and monitoring. So there's some usual, usual suspects here, stuff you should be doing already, right? Continuous security monitoring, really good segmentation with choke points, areas where traffic has to funnel through. A strong authentication, no legacy or, or garbage protocols if you can get that out of the environment. Um, but what's a leading practice? And so I talked a little bit about what Slack's doing, and I tried to show different examples of how you can combine certain things to do really good defense against lateral movement. Um, Slack and Etsy are two of the groups that do fantastic defense against lateral movement. 
So pick your log correlation engine of choice. Um, those are two examples. I don't work for either one. I don't advocate either one. Um, one's just more expensive, right? So if I send all of our logs to Elastic Stack, and you can do this either in real time using Audit D, or you could use Go Audit, which came from Slack. You're gonna stream the logs there in real time. And you can get it off of your environment into like a secure VPC or your own secure cloud, which is a nice leading practice. And then from that, you get data from agents. Um, so Go Audit's one, uh, Carbon Black's another one, our friends over uh, outside there at Cyber Reason have one. OS Query's another one that came from Facebook. That one doesn't necessarily stream data, but it answers questions quickly about what's going on. File integrity monitoring, what kernel modules are loaded, et cetera. And then from that, you can have some special sauce that you'd write. Call it a bot, call it uh, statistical analysis. I promised I wouldn't say machine learning today, so I, I won't say it anymore. But you would essentially mine that data and then you'd want to find out what's going on. Distribute your security problem across the org. Security is not only done by the security team. Everyone defends data at your company. And if you have push notifications or phones, which a lot of us have phones, you can send them a question. Did you log in? Did you mean to do that, yes or no? If they tap no, it's a security event. So let your powers combine to stop lateral movement. That's a good defensive play. All right, bot abuse. Exercise for the audience. Can everyone see what is inside of the uh, lower right-hand corner that's in the courier font? What looks bad about that, that user agent? Tell me what looks wrong with that. Anything with the versions of the components that are in there look funny to you? It could be, it could lie to me. Uh, this client could certainly lie. But they're doing something to throw the defender off. What are they doing with the versions? Look at the version of Chrome, 47.0.49, and then what's happening after that? Why are there letters where integers should be? Oh, it's Yeah, they're being clowns. They're randomizing the version to throw off machine learning and statistics. So, like, this is real. I saw this, and I'm like, you clowns, that's not cool. Like, why would you do that? Like, everything else was static, by the way, except for the versions. I'm like, well, you're not a very good adversary. Like, you can do better. And so we're looking through the logs, we're like, all right, that's a regex solution to that problem. That's what we did. Um, but like, you have to monitor what's happening at your edge because people are gonna use adversary, like, like bots, uh, to abuse forms, could be login, could be registration. They maybe they wanna steal your content, spider your resources, take it, uh, waste your bandwidth, and that's like a problem. But you also can't be so aggressive with your bots that you stop them from spidering your site. Google bot is nice. Bing bot is nice. LinkedIn bot is nice. Uh, Craptasta bot is not nice. So like, what do you do there? Um, you have to do, do a combination of things to make sure the bots stay away. So DDoS mitigation aside, which we should all be doing, what do you do? You can check the browser for integrity. Um, if they're a good bot, they're gonna respond in a certain way. If they're a bad bot, they're probably not gonna solve your challenges. Um, the IP reputation can be looked at. I'm kinda so-so on that because IP's changed so much. Um, but you can issue challenges, and you should be careful about that, but a CAPTCHA, we've all seen Google CAPTCHAs, right? Recaptcha is awesome. Um, it doesn't work for APIs so well, so you gotta be careful with how you're responding. You should respond for JSON on APIs, and you should respond with HTML, HTML, so you should lead out of parity. But you should be able to challenge your browsers. Um, a full Chrome browser can solve JavaScript a lot faster than a bot. Um, and that's a good thing, so that's a defensive play for bots. Um, the whole DDoS stuff, um, you should load balance, you should make sure if, you have a, if you're a big enough target, you use something like Akamai or Cloudflare, but um, I'm more worried about abuse now. The whole DDoS thing, it's not totally solved, but I'm worried about abuse. Um, so you should be able to find those bots, and you know, if they're doing silly stuff like regexing, if you don't have those logs, that's a problem, but if you have the logs, you should be able to notice that. Like, that's interesting. If the user agents are that widely distributed statistically, there's something going on. All right, remote access. If the adversary is not an insider, they need some kind of remote access. So what do you do? So we all have VPNs here, I'm assuming we do. Multi-factor that stuff. Like at least a certificate that you trust as individual plus some credentials, but you can do do all that, push notifications. Um, you can also do neat stuff like geofencing. So I live in Ames, I commute down to Des Moines, and then I go back to Ames. I go to Des Moines, I go to Ames. And I do that all the time. So by doing that, I have a pretty 
predictable pattern of where my IP address is, where I source my connections are going to be from. And yeah, I travel and do other stuff, but I have a pretty predictable pattern. So you could look at those logs and say, all right, Ben Schmidt probably is not going to VPN in from, um, from Denmark 30 minutes after VPN in in Des Moines. Like that doesn't happen, right? That's a problem. So you can apply geofencing. Um, use math to do that. Don't just do it. But you can apply geofencing and look at patterns of connectivity and make sure it matches what you'd expect, things that are plausible. Um, and if they're not plausible, send them a push notification. What's going on? And then you can figure that out. Um, okay. Vulnerability discovery. This one's cool. So if an adversary can detect your weaknesses, they can exploit them for fun and profit. So you remove or mitigate them, and every bit of code probably has vulnerabilities in it. All right, so what do you do? So there's common stuff. Limit your attack surface and scan yourself continuously. Scan your build. Um, Eric Johnson, who's talking here today, I think, gave a really good talk about moving security as far down the development pipeline as you can. Not scan once it's in production. Scan it as far to like the build, if not down to the IDE as you can. Remove the low-hanging fruit. Don't leave that stuff out there. Um, but you can also do more stuff. A private bug bounty program is a good example because you want a responsible way to disclose vulnerabilities and deal with those and reward the researcher. That's all cool. But I think one thing that's really neat leading practice is something that Etsy's been doing. They log everything. If it moves, they log it, and if they can log it, they measure it. Great. Um, they've even been publicly talking a little bit about in the past, they can see from their logging pen testers trying different things. If they see what the pen tester or adversary is doing quickly, they might know about the exploit before the pen tester has exploited it. And if that's the case, then they can fix that bug before it's fully exploited. You can get your bugs for free if you monitor well, well enough. And that's like a really neat place to be. So that's like the zenith of playing application defense at your edge. Uh, supply chain exploitation. So we all need third parties. Do you trust them? Do you trust a third party of a third party of a third party? Well, how do you, how do you get your arms around that? So you don't just add them willy-nilly. You need a vendor management process. It doesn't have to be super onerous, but you should make sure you trust your vendors. How do you gain trust? You need some kind of process. And it may not just be give me your SOC 2 report. It might be show me some, show me your last pen test. Fill out this form. How do you gain that your, your, your vendors are doing the right things? And then based on that, you should probably put them in a portfolio based on the data they access and the materiality of your business. Uh, rank them, and then over time, perform a review, or based on an event, you perform a review. So a good event, um, let's say, so the Cloudflare thing. Um, that would be an event where I'd want to get some comfort, like, okay, so you had this bug, you fixed it quickly, you cleaned up the internet in a week, it's commendable. What have you done to make sure that you've uh, managed that going forward? And that's something your vendor management process, you can then document and then have uh, as a continuous thing you do to evaluate your vendors. Um, and then you should make sure your vendors don't have full-time access to your environment. Give them principal least privilege. Give them what they need and nothing more. Um, I used to work at a phone company, and vendors would have act. This is back when modems were around. Anyone work with modems? Am I dating myself? Like, we don't have those anymore, right? War dialing's pretty, probably still around. I don't know if war dialing still works. But um, you don't give your vendors unfettered access. Give them a VPN, but they should schedule when they need to use it or have a really secure way of getting in your network to help you. They shouldn't have unfettered access to your environment. That's just not cool anymore. Um, you, you guys have all heard about Target, right? They responded well, but not soon enough to a big problem. And that came from a third party portal that a vendor used, an HVAC vendor, and then from there they pivoted and got in and did stuff. Um, so this is like a big deal. Um, this is not just normal compliance work. It's stuff you have to do. So if defense fails, how do you respond? And I think there was a talk earlier about if there's a data breach, what do you do? I think that was given by you. Um, I missed that. I was in the CTF. I apologize, but I'll watch it. So what do you do? Um, no network is intrusion proof. Um, that's a little defeatist to say that, but it's the truth. You need to respond quickly to a security event so it doesn't become a breach. So what do you do? Well, you adapt your defense. Defense is not static. It has to change. It has to evolve just like your adversaries evolve. And you gotta find the evil. So I'm definitely not speaking in the legal realm. I'm speaking like, what does a defensive-minded security team do to support the organization and legal? You need to hunt, isolate, and manage the threat according to a process, a critical security incident response process. 
and you need some training or resources. Either you can call that are trusted and have gone through your vendor risk management process or people in-house that can help isolate the threat. So if you're doing the capture of the flag, I'm not trying to give hints, but volatility might be a useful tool to use in the capture of the flag. That's a framework to go through memory. If you're dealing with an advanced threat, they're probably not gonna write a lot to disk. Like that's old school. They're gonna put stuff in memory and have a memory-based um, exploit. So you probably need to image the memory and go through it and find out what processes are running, what processes are no longer running but still are reflected in memory. Um, what's happening on this host? What's, what's the last, uh, what are the kernel modules running? You need that stuff from memory. So you need to hunt that threat and deal with it. And deal with it probably by doing really good forensic data acquisition following best evidence and chain of, chain of custody, but also being able to go into the memory. Going through disks and looking at your you know, Mac times, that's old school. You need to do a lot more. Um, I don't know if I have time for war stories. Talk to me later. Um, actually, I'll tell you one. So lockouts. This is the most embarrassing piece of code I've ever written in my life. Um, at uh, a different company, not the one I work at now, uh, I got a call. I was really sick, too. I got a call at like 9 at night saying, get in here. Accounts are locking out that are important to production. I'm like, all right. So I get in there, and we're dealing with an old school worm. This is a long time ago. And we had to keep production up. And so I wrote a tool, an endless loop. I did it in a VB script. That's how old it was that would automatically detect account lockouts, unlock them, and log it to a file so we could deal with incident response. And VB script wasn't fast enough. So then I wrote it in PowerShell, which is a lot faster, to automatically unlock accounts that are being automatically locked, log them to a file so we could keep production up but do incident response. If I played like out of the book defense, all right, shut the network down, like that is an issue. We looked at the threat and said, this is automated, it's from the inside, let's mitigate it in a different way. So. I wrote anti-security software to keep production up, but I wrote a really good logging system to make sure I knew exactly what was happening and use those logs to isolate the threat, which is commodity malware. Uh, we'll talk about proxy abuse and bots another time. So I'm kind of getting to my last slide here, and I want to leave a little time for questions, but defense wins championships. Uh, big fan of J.J. Watt. He makes a massive difference. And I don't know if you ever noticed, but the dude catches passes and does some offense once in a while just like defenders ought to do on a network or environment. We play a lot of defense, but we can go ahead and put points on the board. We can kick our adversaries out, and we can scrimmage with them. That's what a capture the flag is. Uh, Reggie White, awesome, Def uh, minister of defense. And then Khalil Mack, he's just a terror on the Raiders. Um, I didn't put Ray Lewis in here, but you get the point. These are defenders that materially change the game. So defense is evolving, and I think it's really exciting. I'm proud to play defense with my team. Um, so look. All right, Ben, what are these new design patterns? Give me like a summary here. Why is defense cool? We're not talking about popping shells and super duper kernel mode, rootkit stuff, pen tester stuff. Give me some cool defensive stuff. Zero trust, net trust networking with sidecars that can handle connections across mesh networks and do signing and security for you. Canaries and honeypots are getting a lot more, um, a lot more popular these days. And this is older stuff. It's been around for a while, 15, 20 years. Control flow integrity or control flow guard. These are compile time settings to stop the Kali Linux kids from doing return-oriented uh, programming on you. Uh, push notifications. I think I've hit that one enough. I'll stop. Uh, Quantum-resistant cryptography. Doing really good choices on public key crypto is important. Uh, I mentioned RSA is a little long in the tooth. Elliptical curve I like a little more. They're going to evolve more in public key. Private key were generally cool. The only real quantum issue there is Grover's algorithm, which is exhaustive key, key search being much faster. AES is good for a while. Just use GCM if you can properly. Um, layer 7 logging so great you get bugs for free. I think that is awesome. Uh, moving left, that's security testing in your build or development process. Like way left is this way to you. Way over here inside of your IDE, you should be fixing bugs. Not when it's out in production. We talked about geofencing. Talked about statistical analysis of data. I won't use the the ML um, term. I won't sprinkle that on top for fun. Mutable architecture, detonation chambers. That's a safe place to put malware and see what it's doing to figure out what you want to respond to without causing an issue. TLS 1.3, awesome stuff. Please use it. And then adaptive defense. A defense is not static. It has to evolve based on the threats. It should scrimmage, but still defense is awesome. I'm proud to play defense. And I work with pen testers. They're fun too, but that's not my jam. So I've got five minutes left. I didn't get the uh, fist pound here, but five minutes. So why don't I stop? Uh, I have an whole appendix. We're not going to go through it. Um, but why don't I stop for a couple of questions? No 
No questions. Sir. Hmm. Um, so it's very much a leading practice or emerging practice. It's not super common if you have legacy infrastructure. Um, so you and I talked earlier about an old manufacturing cell and how does that become immutable? The answer is it really can't. You segment that off and deal with it. This is for green field deployments. Um, can you retrofit it? Sure, if you're using Docker and you're using really good virtualization, you can apply the principles. Um, but it is harder to do if you don't have microservices, load balancers, Docker, and kind of a greenfield environment. So it is a little aspirational, I have to be honest there. But as your vendors give you solutions, ask them, can you do this in immutable architecture? Make your vendor answer that for you. Or if you're greenfielding an app, try and do that. Use it as a design pattern that you're stretching to achieve. It is hard to retrofit on the Windows NT that's sitting around in an old company. But that's why you segment that off. So it's a leading practice. If you have technical debt or you weren't born in the cloud, then it's going to be hard to do. No more questions? All right, thanks a lot for coming. I appreciate it, guys.